Well, um, uh, today, uh, today's paper uh, was originally written last year for several reasons. Uh, therefore, I'm truly amused that this manuscript had already discussed spirits, animals, and technology, the perfect topics for the non-human conference. Well, uh, let me start. Uh, 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 the title is uh, Ghosts in the City, Towards the Aesthetics of the Cyber Picturesque. Well, the ongoing project of Tokyo Olympic Games 2020 cannot help but remind me not simply of Tokyo Olympic Games uh, 1964, I attended as an elementary school kid, but also of Otomo Kasuhiro's six-volume cyberpunk manga, Akira. And, it, Akira, and its anime version, Akira, uh, the 2019 setting of which had already supposed that uh, post-apocalyptic megalopolis, Neo Tokyo, will hold Tokyo Olympic in 2020. The story of Akira unfolds in downtown Neo Tokyo, where the police keep fighting with the Pinchonesque counterforce, with special emphasis upon a couple of teams, a team of extraordinary kids headed by Akira, whose mental ability was so biotechnologically enhanced as to exhibit supernatural power uh, comparable with nuclear energy as well as a team of punks formerly championed by Shima Tetsuo, who somehow happened to gain the same supernatural competence by taking a capsule containing a super potent mind-altering substance, and whose prosthetic and cyborgian body gets metamorphosed into the man-machine interface of Neo Tokyo as such. If without a representation of cyberspace, the impact of Akira undoubtedly coincided with the rise of hardcore cyberpunks such as William Gibson and Bruce Starling in early 1980s North America, who featured a brand new anti-hero computer hacker as outlaw technologist, very active in post-apocalyptic ruins and in cyberspace matrix. Take an example of the low-tech spirit of a counter-cultural tribe Gibson created in one of his first cyberpunk tales, Johnny Mnemonic, published in 1981, featuring a cyborg feminist, Molly Millions, who will be the heroine of uh, Neuromancer, published in 1984. And you will quickly note the vision of low tech to be shared by the punk kids Otomo describes in Akira and Human Weapons, distinguished director Shinya Tsukamoto represents in his Tetsuo trilogy, one of the major inheritors of the Japanese Apache created by Komatsu Sakyo, a uh, founding father of Japanese science fiction, in his first novel, of The Japanese Apache, as I detailed in my book, Full Metal Apache, a Tom introduced some time ago. A further descendant of cyberpunk could well be easily noticed in Neil Blomkamp's directed South African post-cyberpunk film District 9, uh, premiered in 2009, in which the natives of Johannesburg and the miserable aliens lost in space turn out to have the low-tech spirit in common. Uh, the former attempts to make use of aliens' high-tech weapons somehow, whereas the latter joins forces with human friends to find a way to go back home. However, what matters here is not that another Tokyo Olympic Games to come in the new century made me nostalgic for the cyberpunkish 1980s, but that the author of Akira, born in 1954, only one year older than, than me, uh, was already stimulated by the cultural incentive of the high growth period in the early 1960s, when our Tokyo was busy renovating itself in view of the huge international event. Then how could we reconfigure the landscape of early 1960s Tokyo? 
In order to capture the image quickly, I would further expand the primal scene mentioned in the acknowledgement section of Full Metal Apache. As a child in downtown Tokyo in the mid 1950s and 1960s, I was shocked by the destruction and reconstruction of the Institute for Nature Study in Meguro, a unique botanical garden on Shirokane Plateau, which sat just in front of my house at the border between Meguro and Shibuya Ward, and right in the path of construction for the Tokyo Metropolitan Expressway. This primal scene starts with the beautiful garden that had been my favorite playground, and the ugly construction machinery that split uh, the garden and deformed its whole landscape. However, I very soon found myself enjoying the in-between atmosphere of the construction, uh, discovering a new playground in the chaotic and chimeric fusion of the natural forest with the high-tech expressway. Thus, I and my, my fellow kids started riding bicycles on the very construction site of the expressway, it's just like Canada, Tetsuo, and other punk kids of the speed tribes over driving bikes in Neo Tokyo, near Ground Zero of the Third World War that took place in 1997. What is more, I was to discover later that the Institute for Nature Study had already, al always already been more cultural than natural, not only in the way its educational garden reproduced plant communities from Early, earlier days, but also in the way they used to be an explosives warehouse back in Meiji period, and a center closely related with Unit 731, a Japanese military unit notorious for testing on humans and animals illegally and developing new biological weapons during the Second Sino-Japanese War of the World War II which cannot help but recall the way that human experimentations ended up with post-apocalypse in Akira. This is the reason why Shirokane Tunnel, constructed right under the expressway, splitting the formerly beautiful botanical garden, is rumored to have been haunted by a number of ghosts of the victims of Unit 731. Quite a few passers-by have witnessed them. It is this primal scene that paved the way for my post balladian and Gibsonian sensibility. This primal scene narrates not simply the history of the high growth period, but also the genesis of technological landscape as another nature. It is true that I was once depressed with the destruction of the beautiful nature. However, once the Tokyo Metropolitan Expressway started to be under construction for the special convenience of international visitors for Tokyo Olympic uh, 1964. We immediately got used to the new atmosphere, enjoying the border between the ruins and the construction site being made ambiguous. Without this fantastic memory, I could not have accepted cyberpunk in the early 1980s. Yes, for me, the essence of cyberpunk lies in not so much cyberspace as junkyard, where, where punkish low techs keep reappropriating street technology with an aim of overturning dominant culture. In order to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the anime version of Akira, I would like to speculate upon the extraterritorial significance of post-apocalyptic ruins in cyberpunk, especially focusing upon the works ranging from William Gibson's Breach Trilogy in the 1990s through Project Ito, Ito Keikak's uh, post-cyberpunk masterpiece, Genocidal Organ. Uh, so, this is chapter one. <coughs> William Gibson's 1980s Cyberspace Trilogy is followed by his 1990s Breach Trilogy. The Breach Trilogy starts with the near future San Francisco earthquake, uh, nicknamed the Little Grandi, featuring Dr. Shima, uh, Shinya Yamazaki, a sociologist, sociologist from Osaka University who spends years in the homeless 
unlawfully occupied space of San Francisco Bay Bridge. <clears throat> then it transfers its emphasis from California to Tokyo. This time, uh, <clears throat> ex exploring the possibility of a nanotech marriage between a virtual idol, Ray Toei, and a male rock and roller, Low Res, within a reconstructed extraterritorial zone, Kowloon World City in cyberspace, and by the Tokyo Bay. Finally, the whole trilogy closes with the dramatic destruction of San Francisco Bay Bridge and multi multiplication of the virtual idol through nanofax machine. Why do I want to reconsider the significance of the trilogy, virtual light, uh, idol, and all tomorrow's parties? <clears throat> the reason is very simple. The author's speculation upon the bridge reveals his persistent obsession with the extraterritorial which I neglected to explore in my previous discussion. Haunted by the nightmares of his own father as closely involved with Manhattan Project and the Vietnam War, Gibson discovered a way to evade the draft and expatriate himself from South Carolina to Toronto of Canada. Just the way William Faulkner defined himself as a product of the vanquished nation, that is, the American South after the Civil War, Gibson himself did not want to experience the second defeat of his nation through the Vietnam War, ending up with the original idea of cyberspace as a brand new extraterritorial residence. As Brett Cox sharply pointed out, uh, Gibson is a post Faulknerian southerner, Born in 1948 in Conway, South Carolina, he spent nearly 20 years in southern states, such as Virginia and Arizona. It is in 1968 that he moved to Toronto. Since then, except for a year's jaunt in Europe in the early 1970s, Gibson remained in Canada. In an interview conducted in 1993, Gibson 1993, Gibson confessed, I'm still a guy from Virginia. I'll never really be Canadian. <coughs> Unquote. Being aware of himself as a southerner, Gibson never returned to the American South for nearly half a century, familiarizing himself with the multicultural atmosphere of Vancouver, where he graduated from the Department of English at the University of British Columbia in 1977. At this point, we should not forget that uh, he took a science fiction class taught by Susan Wood, uh, which induced him to write his first short fiction, Fragments of a Hologram Rose. What is more, uh, without spending years in Vancouver, a multicultural city uh, which so vividly conjures up the image of Hong Kong as to be nicknamed Hong Kong. He could not have churned out the dark romantic image of Chiba City of Neuromancer. Yes, the fun uh, yes, that phantasmagoric night town of Chiba City could not have been conceived without a trans Pacific negotiation between Vancouver and Hong Kong, if not a Japanese city itself. It is this complexity of deracinated identity that played the role of incubator for a brand new world elsewhere, that is, cyberspace. Before, dis before discussing the formation of expatriate, expatriate uh, sensibility, it is useful to reconsider the extraterritorial as defined by George Steiner in his book originally published in 1971. Uh, this is uh, uh, quotation 0A. <coughs> Uh, although the extraterritorial uh, has long been founded on the legal theory that certain persons and things, while within the territory of a foreign sovereign, uh, remained outside the reach of local judicial process, Steiner primarily redefines the adjective as someone so displaced, out of place or exiled, for various reasons as to command languages other than one's mother tongue. Thus, 
George Steiner renounces the myth of romantic essentialism and gives an insight into the literary potentiality of radically displaced and virtually polylinguistic linguistic writers such as、uh, Franz Kafka, Vladimir Nabokov, Jorge Luis Borges, Samuel Beckett, Ernest Hemingway, and others. Steiner concludes the first essay in the book as follows. <coughs> Uh, this is、uh, my quotation, zero、uh, a.、Uh, quote: It seems proper that those who create art in a civilization of quasi-barbarism, which has made so many homeless,、uh, which has torn up towns and、uh, peoples by the root, should themselves be poets, unhoused, and wanderers across language. Unquote. Moreover, the author's reconfiguration of extraterritorial transcends the boundary of politics and linguistics so easily as to explore the frontiers of interdisciplinary field by incorporating the mental energies and speculative forms of the sciences into educated literacy into the normal life of the imagination. Unquote. A rereading of Steiner today will convince us that today's list of extraterritorial writers never fails to ignore the name of William Gibson, whose displaced identity inspired him to come up with the brand new language of cyberpunk, capable of expanding the interdisciplinary and extraterritorial zone between science and literature. Therefore, what Gibson has consistently described in his novels is not so much、uh, the future of our civilization as the present of today's displaced people, desperately seeking for their own world elsewhere. Another name for extraterritorial zone, as represented by cyberspace, occupied bridge, and Kowloon walled city, virtual and substantial. Chronologically speaking, the moment Gibson shifts emphasis from cyberspace to junkyard was noticed when he paid the first visit to Japan in the winter of 1988, celebrating the completion of cyberspace trilogy *Neuromancer*, *Count Zero*, and *Mona Lisa Overdrive*.、Uh, we had a welcome party for him at an ethnic restaurant called Sunda, located just in front. Of NHK Japan Broadcasting Corporation in Jinnan Shibuya Ward, Tokyo, along with a, a bunch of writers, critics, editors, and film directors. <coughs> yeah, this is the party. Therefore, it is very natural for for me to introduce him to <laughs>、yeah, Gibson. Still has hair at this point.、Yeah. <coughs> Well, therefore, it is very natural for me to introduce him to one of、uh, our distinguished cyberpunkish filmmakers, Ishi Sogo.、Uh, right now, he renamed himself uh, uh, Ishi Gakuryu.、Uh, anyway,、uh, this time I called him Ishi Sogo,、uh, who had been already well known for a pre-cyberpunk movie, *Bus City*,、uh, premiered in 1982. <coughs> Gibson and Ishi started talking about the possibility of their future collaboration. It is regrettable that they could not complete this project, and yet the com- the conversation with Ishi was to inspire Gibson to grasp the essence of his 1990s Bridge trilogy. Let us take a look at his acknowledgments to Idol.、Uh, this is quotation two C. To see, <coughs> Sogo Ishi, a quote. Sogo Ishi, the Japanese director, introduced me to Kowloon Walled City via the photographs of Ryu, Ryuji Miyamoto. It was Ishi-san's idea that we should make a science fiction movie there. We never did, but the Walled City continued to haunt me, though I knew no more about it than I could gather from Miyamoto's stunning images. Which eventually provided most of the texture for the breach in my novel *Virtual Light*. Unquote. If you start reading the *Breach* trilogy chronolo- chronologically, you will be deeply impressed with the way San Francisco Bay Bridge, occupied by the homeless, is replaced by another 
Kowloon Walled City reconstructed in cyberspace and Tokyo Bay. However, it is Ryuji Miyamoto's photographic collection of Kowloon Walled City, the most illegally built construction in world history, that first captured Gibson's cyberpunk low-tech imagination in the winter of 1988, leading him to write a short story, Skinner's Room, in 1989, based upon the image of <clears throat> the destroyed Bay Bridge as a collaboration with talented architects Min Fan and Craig Hodgetts for Paolo Pol Polidori's exhibition, Visionary San Francisco held in 1989 at San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. It is Asian Gothic image of Kowloon World City as another extra extraterritorial zone that had first inspired Gibson to represent the near future San Francisco Bay Bridge occupied by the unhoused, not vice versa. Here lies the extraterritorial seas of trans-Pacific cyberpunk. So, uh, chapter two, uh, from San Francisco Bay Bridge to Kowloon World City. To tell the truth, even the junk art-like bridgescape of virtual light had already been not immune from postmodern Japanese aesthetics. Indeed, this novel beautifully envisions the near future post-earthquake San Francisco Bay Bridge in 2005, around when California itself has split into two states, SoCal and NoCal, with the Bay Bridge linking San Francisco and Oakland closed. <clears throat> this catastrophe induced ex-hippies and former homeless to storm the very bridge space and build themselves a new self-governing community therein, and redesign the whole bridge whose neo-dadaistic ecology is to be renamed Thomason by Yamazaki, the Japanese sociologist from Osaka University, conducting research on the formation of the bridge culture. While the archetypal short story Skinner's Room does not allude to Thomason, the novel version, uh, Virtual Light, brilliantly reflects this neo-dadaistic neo aesthetics in representing uh, the occupied bridge. This is uh, quotation one, <coughs> one A, one A. <coughs> Quote, it still bonds uh, the standard tendons while lost within an accretion of dreams, tattoo parlors, gaming arcades, dimly lit tales stacked with decaying magazines, Sellers of fireworks, of cut bait, betting shops, sushi bars, unlicensed uh, pawn brokers, uh, herbalists, uh, barbers, bars, dreams of commerce, their locations generally corresponding with the decks that had once carried uh, bigger uh, traffic, while above them, uh, rising to the very peaks of uh, <coughs> the cable towers lifted the intricately suspended barrier with its unnumbered population and its zones of more private fantasy. In all world, surely, there was no more magnificent uh, Thomason. What is Thomason? The author explains its etymology in the novel as follows. This is 1b. This is quotation 1b. Thomason was an American baseball player, very handsome, very powerful. He went to the Yomiuri Giants in 1982 for a large sum of money. Then it was discovered that he could not hit the ball. The writer, Genpei Akasegawa, appropriated his name to describe certain useless and inexplicable monuments, pointless yet curiously art-like features of the urban landscape. But the term has subsequently taken on other shades of meaning. If you wish, I can access and translate today's definitions in our Gendai Yogo no Kiso Chishiki, that is, the basic knowledge of modern times. Unquote. However, the novel gives us 
no further analysis of this hyper art illustrating the point with no examples Genpei Akasegawa enumerates in downtown Tokyo. In my former article on the novel, originally published in 1995, I only redefined this hyper art as closely intertwined with Marcel Duchamp and Joseph Cornell, whose Dadaist works Gibson had long been fascinated with, not only in Neuromancer but also in Count Zero. At that point, I simply emphasized the way Akasegawa, the neo Dadaist, radically Japanized Duchamp as the near precursor of Thomason, who could not attain Thomasonian perfection unluckily, but whose sense of non-art brilliantly correspond with the Japanese heritage of tea ceremony represented by Sen no Rikyu, in which the very natural world has persistently been considered full of ready-made objects. Therefore, when Virtual Light was first published in 1993, I attempted to relate the aesthetics of neo dadaist art with the ecology of post-countercultural treehouse Gibson must have been familiar with. Uh, with the Bridge Trilogy completed in 1999, however, I feel it indis indispensable to link this hyper-art with Kowloon World City, high technologically replicated. Now, this is three house I once compared uh, uh, with uh, Gibson's uh, <coughs> uh, uh, destroyed uh, bridge, Bay Bridge, uh, uh, stormed by homeless people. This is Thomason. <coughs> well, <coughs> in in, uh, in in retrospect. Uh, the archaeology of ruins tells us it is a dissolution of the monasteries ordered by Henry VIII between 1536 and 1541 that made quite a few Catholic abbeys, the typical ruins, which only attracted the opportunistic businessmen and the melancholy antiquary. However, in the course of three centuries, straightforward, greed was followed by ignorance and indifference and curiosity <coughs> led to veneration. Uh, without Henry VIII's transformation of the abbeys into ruins, English literary history could not have developed the imagination of Gothic romance. Likewise, without post-war apocalyptic tragedies, whether natural or political, postmodern literature could not have cultivated the imagination of cyberpunk junkyard as another extraterritorial playground. This perspective allows me to illustrate Thomason with mysterious and indefinable objects in Tokyo cityscape. Akasegawa once defined Thomason as any kind of useless and defunct object attached to someone's property and aesthetically maintained. Uh, quote, this kind of Thomason he discovered included the door knob in the wall without a door, that driveway leading into unbroken fence. Yeah, this is a typical Thomason. Uh, that strange concrete uh, thing, that strange concrete thing uh, sprouting out of your sidewalk with no discernible purpose. Well, the most famous one among them is nicknamed Yotsuya no Junsui Kaidan. A pure sta staircase of Yotsuya, or simply Yotsuya Kaidan. Um, so. Yeah, this one. Okay. Well, um, the most, uh, yeah, Yotsuya Kaidan, a flight of stairs leading into a blank wall without a door. Uh, with a, uh, a handle rail still being maintained. You could well be amused by this uh, nomenclature for Yotsuya Kaidan, derives from a pan on, uh, as a strange staircase, Kaidan, located in Yotsuya, Shinjuku ward, and a ghost story, Kuaidan, uh, originated in the same town and well known as a kabuki play, performed time and again. 
of a contemporary high-tech city, especially in the wake of uh, quite a few apocalypses, such as the World War II, uh, huge earthquakes and the burst of bubble economy became indistinguishable, indistinguishable from artistic ruins filled with numerous thomasons, that is, mysterious objects which seem to be useful at first glance, but which turned out, turned out to be not simply dysfunctional, but also hyper-artistic. What creates thomasons is not the genius of romantic artists in the attic, but the gaze of flaneurs strolling aimlessly through the streets. Therefore, in 1986, Akasegawa and his colleagues, such as Fujimori Terunobu, Matsuda Tetsuo, Minami Shinbo, and Hayashi Joji, formed a society for observing objects on the streets. Uh, the strange objects uh, compiled into their photo album included vegetable wiper, vegetable television, uh, ornithic television, and others. What attracts me most now is one of the Thomasons entitled Kaldun World City for Chickens, uh, discovered and photographed by Hayashi Joji in 1986. So what you could see Kaldun World City uh, <coughs> for Chickens. Uh, what matters here is that already in the mid-1980s, even the founding fathers for Neo-Dadaism somehow gave an insight into an analogy between the hyper-art Thomason and Kowloon World City. Then how important is Kowloon World City in Hong Kong for postmodern culture and literature? As summed up about Gibson's fifth novel called Idaho, published in 1996, the companion piece of his fourth novel, Virtual Light, published in 1993, features a romance between the rock and roller, uh, Low Reds, and the Asian AI heroine, Ray Toei, in 2006, almost one year after the post earthquake events on the San Francisco Bay Bridge narrated in virtual light. Around this period, nanotech engineering enabled the post earthquake Tokyo to quickly reconstruct it, elaborate virtual spaces, have been constructed as well, even replicating the whole bad taste structure of the Kowloon World City, Haknam, a place of interest in Hong Kong, destroyed in 1993. Note that it is not only Gibson, but also numerous postmodern artists who lamented the destruction of the greatest place of interest in Hong Kong. Thus, the 1996 fabrication of this novel Idol beautifully coincides with the creation of the latest Japanese post-cyberpunk computer game, Kaolun's Gate, directed by Kimura Nakaji and marketed in 1997 by Sony Music Entertainment, featuring a distinguished Feng Shui master who is to restore the equilibrium between yin and yang abruptly jeopardized in the very year of 1997 by the intrusion of the unreal Kowloon World City uh, into the real world. We are nightmarish, as it seems. The extraterritoriality of Kowloon World City appealed to a variety of postmodern artists and writers. This is the cover of Idol. Uh, the left one is uh, for hardcover, and uh, the right one is for paperback. And, and this is uh, uh, the first Japanese virtual idol. <laughs> yeah, Kyoko Date. And uh, yeah, this is the uh, latest <laughs> model of virtual idol. Uh, this is the game, Kowloon's Gate, coincided with uh, <coughs> the publication of Idol. Then, how important is Kowloon City in... Oh, no. <coughs> uh, well, historically speaking, the origin of Kowloon World City, a weird extraterritorial space of uh, 2.7 
hectare located a few hundred meters to the northwest of Hong Kong's Kai Tech International Airport could well be located in the Sun Dynasty of the 5th century. This is uh, a quotation 0B, 0B. Nonetheless, it is after the outbreak of the Opium War in 1839 that this site came to gain more military importance. As Kenichi Ohashi spells out with the defeat of the uh, Qing forces in 1842, the Treaty of Nanking was signed and Britain took possession of the island of Hong Kong, prompting the Qing to build an actual world fortress <coughs> in Kowloon by 1847. Even after the Treaty of Peking, uh, Beijing in 1860, <coughs> which enabled Britain to obtain the Kowloon Peninsula south of Boundary Street, the world city of Kowloon exceptionally remained <coughs> under Qing jurisdiction. Therefore, this site had to retain the double status of extraterritoriality. Although Hong Kong became British legally, only this site kept being controlled by Chinese government. <coughs> Nonetheless, what with the Japanese occupation of the site in 1941, and what with the popular resistance ending up with the burning of the British consulate in Canton, disagreements over the status of the Kowloon World City between the Chinese and British governments dramatically increased. Thus, the city itself gradually became a kind of diplomatic black hole existing in limbo between two countries, inviting a number of refugees and displaced people to inhabit the very extraterritorial site. They all wanted to avoid taxation or legal interference from the colonial government. What is more, this site was convenient for the Chinese triad societies, which popularized the idea that it was Chinese territory and therefore not subject to Hong Kong law to promote their illegal dealings, such as gambling, drug trafficking, and prostitution. In this way, Kowloon Old City came to be nicknamed as a den of inquity, iniquity, the Caspa of the East, and the uh, hotbed of uh, crime. With this history in mind, you will fully enjoy Gibson's representation of Kowloon World City replicated <coughs> within cyberspace. <coughs> With the help of uh, otaku boy Masahiko, usually spending hours in the site, the heroine, Chia McKenzie, a 14-year-old girl from Seattle and a big fan of low Red's rock and roller, uh, vividly witnesses the gigantic structure. This is uh, quotation 2A. <coughs> so what do I? Something at the core things moved simultaneously in mutually impossible directions. It wasn't even like quoting software conflict, faint impression of light through a fluttering of rugs, and then the thing before her, building or uh, bio, biomass or a cliff face looming there in countless unplanted strata, nothing about it even or regular accreted patchwork of shallow, random balconies, thousands of small windows throwing back blank silver rectangles of fog, stretching either way to the periphery of vision and on the high, uneven crest of that ragged facade, a black wall, or a black of uh, twisted pipe, uh, antennas uh, sagging under under vine growth of cable and past this scribbled border, a sky where colors crawled like gasoline on water. Hakna, he said, beside her. What is it? City of darkness between the walls of the world. <coughs> and uh, this is uh, quotation 2b. <coughs> 
the world city is the concept of scale, very important. Scale is place, yes. Uh, 33,000 people inhabited original, 2.7 hectares, as many as 14 story, uh, stories. <coughs> Unquote. The novel reaches the greatest climax when the cutting edge nanotechnology succeeded in replicating the same city by the Tokyo Bay almost miraculously. Uh, quote, uh, the world city is growing, being grown from the fabric of the beach, rock, and wreckage of the world before things changed, a thing of random human accretion, monstrous and superb. It is being recon reconstituted here, uh, uh, retranslated from its later incarnation as a realm of consensual fascination. Of course, low res uh, desire to get married to Ray Toei as AI sounds quite childish in the first place, for low res is human, ray artificial. However, as is the case with Zona, Chia's uh, close friend in Mexico, who proves to be half virtual, it is not unusual that the most intimate friend of yours might be only hovering on the boundary between the human and the artificial. This principle is also applicable of Kowloon World City. Now that Kowloon World City uh, despite the resistance, persistent resistance, was torn down in 1993, we are able to experience it only cybernetically on the border between reality and virtual reality. The reason why the site is still alive in people's memory is very simple. As Miyamoto Ryuji himself redefined it in a vanished city, the preface to his photographic collection, uh, quote, the Kowloon World City was a massive crystallization of the communal unconscious of the Chinese, a miraculous, uncommonly transcendent phenomenon of human, of human ingenuity, which just happened to rise up before our eyes, unquote. Thus, in my guest edited issue of Asahi Weekly Encyclopedia, uh, featuring science fiction and slipstream literature, I once st stated that if I'm permitted to visually represent the zeitgeist of boundary tra transgression, I feel no hesitation to select the Kowloon World City as its objective correlative. Although the Chinese government destroyed it in 1993, this city still keeps inspiring writers and artists to produce novels and TV games with the very site as a main setting. While it used to hover over the political boundary between Britain and China, this huge world city now deconstructs and reinvents itself the very epistemological boundary between reality and virtual reality. With the rise of Brit exit and the Trump presidency, which requires displaced people to dream of another extraterritorial zone, in the second decade of the 21st century, the late Kowloon World City is getting more and more significant. Three, conclusion, ghost in the city or genocidal organ. The Kowloon, Kowloon World City vanished from the earth in 1993. However, as the legendary game Kowloon's Gate still keeps haunting our mind, we are still likely to envision a number of ghosts and monsters very active in the imaginary city. Yes, it is a ghost of the very city that has long obsessed us, for cyberpunk has persistently questioned the boundaries between the organic and the mechanic, the living and the dead, civilization and the junkyard. Now, please recall the introduction of uh, <coughs> uh, this paper, where I started by talking about the post-apocalyptic junkyard of 20... 19 Neo Tokyo in Akira, overlapping with the construction site of uh, the Tokyo Metropolitan Expressway, uh, seamlessly with the destruction site of the beautiful botanical garden of the Institute for Nature Study in 1963 Tokyo. As Akira narrates the aftermath of human experimentation, 
that has brought about the nightmare of total apocalypse. The Real Institute for Nature Study secretly contains the military tragedy of human-animal experimentation that has to produce quite a few ghost stories closely related with the tunnel under the very expressway. Just like the ghost in the shell and its sequel, Innocence, we are not free from the preternatural within technoscape of our megalopolis. With this context in mind, <coughs> It was amusing to see a fantastic cafe restaurant, Giga Bar, constructing, constructed in the late 1980s near the entrance of the Shirokane Tunnel, right under the said expressway, receiving popularity until the mid-1990s, when trouble with Yakuza uh, forced the manager to close the restaurant. Uh, this is the tunnel haunted with ghosts. Uh, this is uh, H.R. Giga, and he designed uh, his own restaurant in Shirokane. Yeah, just like this. Yeah, this is his most famous movie. And yeah, this is uh, Giga Bar's entrance, but uh, it was already uh, destroyed. <coughs> well, uh, Note that the name suggested uh, its organic and biomechanical atmosphere was inspired by distinguished Zurich-based artist H.L. Giga, well known for the cover jacket of pro rock band Emerson Lake and Palmer, Brain South Surgery, and also for the art direction of Ridley Scott's film Alien. Famous as he is for the hardcore cyberpunk uh, Blade Runner, uh, Ridley Scott should be further appreciated as a prophet of alternative cyberpunk, as is outlined in Alien, one of whose sequels, uh, Alien 3, was to be written by William Gibson himself in vain. Anyway, to me, it does not seem coincidental that the heyday of bubble economy around 1990 saw the cyberpunk taste of Gigaba Tokyo, located just in the neighborhood of Shirokane Tunnel, haunted by the ghosts of pre-cyberpunkish biomechanical experiments. So let me close the chapter with a note on the latest fruit of trans-Pacific cyberpunk, uh, Murase Shuko's directed anime, Genocidal Organ, a faithful adaptation of self-claimed cyberpunk writer uh, Ito Keika, Project Ito's masterpiece, uh, originally published in 2007. As the title suggests, it is undoubtedly uh, September 11 terrorist attacks that invited the author, Project Ito, to create an enigmatic linguist, John Paul, a former PR man who grasped the se secrecy of genocidal organ within human organism. Just the way Tyrone's Lothrop, making love, uh, never fails to be followed by the assault of V2 rocket in Thomas Pynchon's pre-cyberpunk mega novel, Gravity's Rainbow, published in 1973, John Paul travels from war zone to war zone as if he is the prime mover of war itself, thus desperately seeking John Paul. The protagonist, narrator, Clavis Shepard, recognizes the fact, quote, this man uh, who we tried and failed to kill on numerous occasions had somehow been a catalyst for genocide in locations throughout the world. For some reason, when this man went into a country, it plunged into chaos. For some reason, uh, no, uh, unquote. Uh, for some reason, uh, when this man went into a country, the blood of innocents would pour forth, unquote. The concept of the novel itself very naturally reminds us of what Hannah Arendt called the banality of evil in her Eichmann in Jerusalem. Uh, Project Ito's originality lies not in his narrativization of Eichmann-like characters in war zones, but in his speculation on an imaginary organ, inherent deep within human linguistic competence that gets started through the speech act of the very spell John Paul discovered. Although the precise identity of the spell remains unknown throughout the novel, the mysterious stranger John Paul could well be 
reconceived as a kind of talented cyberspace cowboy, cowboy who could very easily get access to the secret of human nature that could otherwise have been kept confidential. In this sense, genocidal organ also recalls the hardcore cyberpunk Akira, which centers around the secret of the universe. The, infant, um, the unfound terrible Akira conceals within himself. Furthermore, we should not forget that while genocidal organ remains uh, a secrecy for human beings, the rapid growth of the African huge industry of artificial flesh was made possible through harvesting from gen genetically modified ac aquatic mammals such as dolphins and whales, unquote. On one hand, if, if we focus on the narrative of John Paul, it's readable as a hardcore Gibsonian quest for holy grail. On, on the other hand, if we take a careful look at artificial flesh employed not only for military operations, but also for various reasons, the whole narrative begins to show the operations, but also uh, show the post-Gigarian uh, aesthetics at the risk of today's eco-critical imperative. However, what I would like to call your attention most is the post-apocalyptic aspect of the novel anime of genocidal organ. Although cyberpunk narratives have scarcely been discussed in the eschatological context, its genealogy from Blade Runner, the Cyberspace Trilogy, the Bridge Trilogy, Akira, down to genocidal organ, all presupposes a kind of the end of the world that had already taken place uh, before the beginning of each story. If Gibson invented cyberspace as an extraterritorial zone, exempt either from the draft or from nuclear politics his own father had been responsible for, it makes perfect sense to reconsider cyberpunk as another post-apocalyptic narrative. And we have to note that also in this respect, Project Ito gives a deep insight into the essence of war in the wake of nuclear destruction of an Eastern European city. This is a quotation number three. <coughs> Quote, the world changed the day the bomb exploded in Sarajevo. The era of Hiroshima was brought to a close once and for all. All around the world, the military, the military suddenly started waking up to the fact that their theoretical weapons of mutually assured destruction were maybe not so theoretical after all. Nuclear weapons were back on the table as an option. Unquote. <coughs> theoretically speaking, the end of the world should allow for no survivors. However, it is true that post-apocalyptic narratives cannot fail to describe the life of survivors without the sense of contradiction. A big fan of J.G. Ballard, a major speculative fictionist who published a number of dystopian stories, John Paul, uh, the protagonist of uh, <coughs> the genocidal organ, possibly dreamed of a world in ruins. Quote, Spaceship Mother Earth, a giant unmanned satellite that silently orbited the, uh, sun, the sun, a world where aliens would land one day and find only the traces of civilization long destroyed, the empty husks of building after building, whose inhabitants had long since disappeared." Unquote. Thus, transpacific cyberpunks will continue narrating the world after the end of the world, refreshing the memory of Hiroshima and Nagasaki as the first nuclear war. This is the reason why our survivors will also keep seeking for the extraterritorial zone, making ambiguous the border between the ruins and the construction site. Thank you for your attention.